So our first definition, Taylor and McLaurin series are, uh, they describe the same thing. Uh, the only difference is where they're centered. So we'll just write out a Taylor series definition first and then talk about how the McLaurin series is related. There we go. <coughs> so we're going to start with a function, y equals f of x. Of course, you need a nice function. You need to be able to take derivatives. So you need to have a function that's differentiable, which is pretty much what you need in most calculus uh, for almost every calculus property can't take derivative of your function, you really can't do any calculus with it. So the Taylor series so it is the series, the power series the summation uh, we'll write it CN sometimes they use A for the uh, x value you're centered at x minus A to the N and equals zero to infinity. Uh, now, this is just a power series, but the specific coefficient cn, if it's a Taylor series, is very uh, important which one uh, that is. So with cn is going to be the nth derivative, the nth derivative evaluated at a divided by n factorial. So the numerator is the nth derivative evaluated at a, evaluated at x equals a, and this is just n factorial. So the n factorial might look a little weird, but if you keep taking derivatives of a, a polynomial, you basically if your polynomial is a degree 5, you'll get a uh, times 5, and then take another derivative, you get times 4, times 3, times 2. And so the factorial uh, basically takes care of the repeated derivatives of a power function as you drop down. So this is what a Taylor series is. It's a specific power series. Um, and it will be the infinite version is equal to the actual function itself. So if done correctly, and it converges. So when x is in i, the interval of convergence, uh, let's give this series a name. We'll call it t, t of x, a Taylor, Taylor series of x. So if the Taylor series converges, then t of x equals f of x. So they will be equal if your x is in the interval of convergence. So Taylor series doesn't just approximate your function, it's actually exactly equal. The only problem is you cannot practically take infinite derivatives, because so you don't have enough time. So practically what we do is we take enough derivatives and then there's a way to estimate the error and we just to expand out to 10 or 20 degree uh, Taylor series and then use that. So this is how to get a Taylor series. So we can do an example now. Uh, now if I write it out what it actually looks like. So fully expanded form looks a little bit ugly. So I will write it out here. So I'll write it with the summation first. Summation, now I'm going to write the actual version of cn right here. So it's the nth derivative of f at a divided by n factorial multiplied by x minus a to the n power, n equals zero to infinity. Now what this looks like, so what is a zero derivative of a function? That's just the function itself. So a zero derivative is just the function. So the n equals 0 term is just f of a. And think 0 factorial is just 1. 
and x minus a to the 0 power is also 1. So the factorial part disappears. The x minus a to the n is just 1 also. So that's going to disappear. The, the 1 term, that's going to be f prime at a times x minus a to the first power divided by 1 factorial. Next term will be the n equals 2 term. So it's f second derivative at a times x minus a squared divided by 2 factorial. And the next term looks pretty similar. Now I could go f triple prime. But at some point, it's silly to keep writing prime, prime, prime. So we'll not write it here. And instead, we're going to use this notation. So that parentheses 3 means third derivative. So here we're going to take a third derivative of f, plug in a. So that'll be some number multiplied by x minus a cubed divided by 3 factorial. And at this point, we can write dot, dot, dot. So you just keep bumping up the derivative power, the factorial, and the x minus a power. So that was the first three, four terms expanded out. So we'll do an example now. So we either did sine or cosine last quarter. I think if we did cosine, let's, let's find the Taylor for sine x at x equals 0. So this will be our first example. So what we need to do is find derivatives until we can see a pattern happening. So find the nth derivative. So in order to find the nth derivative, we're going to find the first four or five derivatives until we see a pattern. Then we're going to plug in the a value and then see what that pattern looks like. So we're going to figure out what is the nth derivative. So first one, actually we'll do no derivative first, just original. f of x is sine x. Now we're going to go f prime of x as easy as cosine f double prime of x f triple prime of x quadruple prime quintuple prime septuple prime maybe I'm making this up whatever's after that so hopefully at this point you'll be able to say what the nth derivative is. So go ahead and compute the first six derivatives. You should see a pattern happening. And then we'll need an nth derivative formula. So do that right now. There's going to be a negative sign hanging out somewhere. Don't make sure you get it in the right spot. So you should have found your fourth derivative is back up where you started, hopefully. Because it goes sine cos, sine cos. So that alternates every two. But because of the negative sign, you've got to wait sort of two cycles to get back where you started. So if I try to write the nth derivative, it's either going to be plus or minus and then either sine or cos. So it's a little bit messy right now. 
what I'm going to do is plug in the A value first. What would happen if I plugged, so our A is 0, x equals 0 is our A value. What happens if I plugged in 0 and then took the derivative? What would I get? I would get 0 for every derivative because derivatives of numbers are all 0. So we want to make sure don't plug in before you take derivatives. You want to get your derivative first, and then you can plug in your value. So let's go ahead and do, uh, we're going to actually plug in uh, 0 now. So f of 0, that's sine 0, which is 0. f prime of 0 is cos 0, which is definitely not 0. That's positive 1. f double prime of 0. So finish off this pattern and then see if you could find the nth derivative evaluated at 0. And it's going to be a step function. So you should definitely see three outputs possible. Zero, negative one, or positive one. So how do we properly say which one is zero, which one is one, and which one is minus one? So zeros are easy to spot. How do I know we're going to get a zero? Even. even. So what is even? N is even. So if n is even, we got zero. Now, I can't just say if n is odd, you get 1. So it's a little more complicated than that. So specifically, how do I get positive 1? What types of n's? So how about 1 and 5? What would the next number be? 9. 9. And then 13. If you use your fingers, you can tell me the next one. You just keep adding 4, right? So I could write it as, if you could write n as 1 plus 4m for some integer m, that would be one way to write it. Um, we're going to write this in a much better way in a minute. Uh, and negative 1, if you get, negative 1 starts at 3, and it would have been 7, so 3, 7, and all. After that, so we can start at 3 plus 4m. So I start at 3 and then every other multiple of 4 after that. All right, so the even ones are out. That's what this first one tells you right here. So even ones are out. So how do I skip even ones? Basically, just make sure n is odd. How am I going to do that? So when we write our summation. Uh, if I want to skip all the evens, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go count by 2n plus 1. So what is that going to do? When n is 0, I get 0 times 2 plus 1 is 1. What do I get when n is 1? I get 3. 2 times 1 is 1 plus 1 is 3. And when n is 2, I get 4 plus 1 is 5. So what we do right here is I'm going to count by 2's, but I don't want all the even ones. I want all the odd ones so that 
I add a one afterwards. So this will give me all the odd terms. So any questions on that little trick right there? So it's a little bit tricky. So this lets me count up all the odd ones starting at one. So a lot of stairs. Is that that's okay? All right. If I wanted the even ones, it's pretty easy. Just knock out the little plus one. I would have gotten zero, two, four, six, eight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm just going to reconstruct the whole thing. X minus here A is zero. Now you have to be fair everywhere. Everywhere there was an n is now a 2n plus 1. So I can't just swap out one of them. I have to go every single place. So I'm just going right here. And I'm saying, um, actually, I'm going somewhere. I just pretty much rewrote this right here, where I placed all the n's by 2n plus 1. OK. Ooh, don't forget infinity. All right, so now we're ready to talk about what is C of 2n plus 1. Now, it's still a little tricky. It's either 1 or negative 1. So how do we alternate between 1 and negative 1? You definitely saw this. So it was negative 1 to the n. So we're going to do something really similar to that. So let's try it and see if it actually works. So what's negative 1 to the, in this case, 0 power? Negative 1 to the 0 power. Positive 1. Is that what we want for our initial term? It looks like positive 1 works. And what about, that's a little weird, when n is 1 now, when n is 1 is the next term, because you're going to get actually 3 down here and 3 uh, for 2n plus 1. However, when n is 1, negative 1 to the first power is still negative 1. So this will let us alternate signs here. And we'll just copy the rest over. I don't need to write the uh, x minus 0. So I'm just going to leave it like this. So there is our Taylor series for the sine. We start with sine, yes. So this is sine x. Did I do an interval of convergence yet? Nope, didn't run any tests at all. What's a good test if I asked you for interval of convergence? Ratio, when in doubt, that's going to be the right answer probably 80% of the time, approximately. It's a good one to go for. All right, this is going to work almost exactly like the uh, problem we did yesterday. So you're just going to do a ratio test, and you're going to get a factorial on the bottom. And I said yesterday, factorials are super powerful. You're going to find out it beats everything else. I think we did that, a problem with factorial yesterday. Yeah, this problem right here. It's a little different, but the ratio test will work out in a really similar way on this compared to the one that we're working on right now. So it's going to act really similar to this problem right here. Yeah. I think I was a little bit lazy about what C was. So up here, I put C with a factorial. So technically, down here, I should not have that factorial in the denominator. That was grouped up with the CN part. I don't know if that was your question or not. No, the subscript on the, on the C, the 2n plus 1. Oh, why did I do that? Where did it go? Uh, n plus one. Or, or why did it not carry over? 
It carried over to the factorial part, but I needed the sign to alternate not even odd. Every power of x is going to be odd, so it's not alternating on the even oddness. It's alternating on whether it's a Probably the best way to think about it is positive first and negative second, positive, negative, positive, negative. And so here's the first term that's not zero is the first derivative, and I need a positive one. The next non-zero is three, and I need a negative one. So it's a little weird because we're sort of using n for two different things. All right, so that was sine. What do we get if we take derivative of sine? Easy question. Cosine. So we can get an expansion for cosine without actually computing the whole thing out. So if this is sine, we're going to find the derivative of what we say this is actually equal to. All right, so go ahead and take this derivative. The left side is super easy. And I'll do the first step on the right side. You can swap the summation with the derivative. And remember, derivative is an x derivative. doesn't care about n's. cares about x's. There's only one place x appears. So this is mostly a constant derivative. So the actual calculus step is pretty, pretty simple. Just make sure you think about x derivative. So I skipped the factorial reduction step. So negative 1 to the n is constant. 2n plus 1 factorial is constant. All I have to worry about, multiply by the old power of x, which is 2n plus 1. So that cancels one of the 2n plus 1 uh, parts down here in the factorial. So that's a 2n factorial. And then the new power, instead of being 2n plus 1, it's 2n plus 1 minus 1, or just 2n, right there. All right, so that is cosine. If you look in your textbook, it should say this right there. And if you want to take the scenic route and take enough derivatives until you see the pattern form, you'll see that all of the odd ones will be 0. All the even ones will stick around, and it will go plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. So it'll have the alternating, and all the odd ones won't be there. All right, so that is how to take derivative of a power series. The other classic power series or Taylor series we will use So a long time ago, we looked at this equality. We 
There's also a geometric series. It was only true if x was not very big, though. So if you remember way back in the day, this x had to be absolute value less than 1 for it to converge. All right, so these are equal when x absolute value is less than 1. If it's not less than 1, what happens? The left side's fine. As long as x doesn't equal 1, the left side will be just fine. What happens on the right side if x is, let's say, even just 1? Diverges to what? Infinity. So it's very easy for the right side to be infinity if x is 1 or bigger. So this only equals when x is small. All right, what is the derivative of natural log of 1 minus x? One over one minus x times what? Times zero minus one. So negative one over one minus x. All right, so that's the derivative. And this is almost what we started with. It's just negative summation x to the n and equals zero to infinity. So this is the derivative of that natural log. What if I wanted to just know what is natural log of 1 minus x equal in a summation notation in a Taylor series? How do I go from the second to last line to the last line? So I know the derivative of natural log, what that equals. How do I find, how do I solve for just natural log 1 minus x? Antiderivative. So we're going to undifferentiate. So this will equal the antiderivative of, I'm just going to copy this part down right here. So the derivative of natural log was this. So the regular natural log is going to be equal to this. We're going to have a plus c at the very end. So I'm actually going to go put the c at the beginning because the way the terms are ordered, the constant would be out front, not at uh, the end. All right, this is an easy antiderivative. Going to be summation. So we're going to add 1 divided by n plus 1. All right, calculus questions on that. Just added 1 to the power, divide by that new power. This is like a calc 1 antiderivative. Why does the need to go from? Because uh, when you, generally when you write these in order, it goes the smallest power and then increasing powers to the right. So I just put, I knew C was, C's a constant, not depending on x, so I just put it at the front so it would be in the, the position you would expect it. Uh, let's see. So we have to decide where we center this. I believe this is centered at zero depending on how you think of it. Yeah, the way we wrote it, this is centered at 0. Now, if I write the first few terms out, we could have c minus. Now, I'm going to plug in 0. And we're going to get x to the first power divided by 1 factorial, which is 1, minus x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3 minus x to the fourth over 4 minus dot dot dot. 
how in the world can I figure out what C should equal? Can't really use algebra. So there's an infinite number of terms on the right side. But what about if x equals 0? What happens to all those terms? They disappear because they'll all be 0. So this should be equal for all x values, certainly at the one we're centered at, specifically. But hopefully it'll be good for a couple values close to 0 as well. So what we're going to do, we plug in 0. That'll allow us to basically not worry about all the terms on the right side. And we're just going to have, and we have to treat x the same on both sides. So I can't just plug in 0 on the right and do nothing on the left. We're allowed to plug it in because we know for sure it's going to work at that x value. I can try to plug in 2. However, I can see right now the right side will be negative infinity if I actually plug <coughs> 2 in. I'll keep adding up larger and larger negative numbers. So they certainly will not be equal. So we're going to plug in x equals 0. So we have ln of 1 equals c minus 0 minus 0. So ln of 1 is what number? 0. All right, so 0 equals c. So I can write the final answer. We did get a plus C, but I can take care of it because I know what I want. And all I have to do is plug in the correct X value, and it will basically throw away any term with the X in it. So I can write my final answer, ln 1 minus X equals, now I know C is 0, so I'm just going to write negative summation X to n plus 1 over n plus 1. So I didn't do any interval of convergence. I think you'll have some homework problems that do intervals of convergence. And we did an interval yesterday. So I'm not going to go over how to do the interval for this one right here. Um, I could say probably the ratio test would be a good one for this. We'll probably go ratio test on this one. So I briefly talked about Maclaurin series, and I'll just write down the difference. Maclaurin series Maclaurin series is a Taylor series. where A is 0. So we're technically doing a um, Maclaurin series on uh, this natural log problem because it was centered at 0. So you're going to find a lot of the problems that are going to be centered at 0, and specifically that is called a Maclaurin series. So that's going to be the end of chapter 10. So we'll do chapter 11 starting tomorrow.